What I love to do is introduce the right people to the right people, assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, what's up, guys? Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and we are searching for our next investment opportunity. I'm joined right now by Mike Maloney, the CEO and founder of GoldSilver.com and the best-selling author of Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. I'm, I'm glad to have you back on the show. We haven't seen each other in a few years. Yeah. Uh, I can't recall the last conference we had you speak at, but uh, a benefit of doing this remote is that we can get in touch with people like you easier. So I'm excited to dig into a few topics with you today. And I want to start, Mike, by um, getting your thoughts on which macro themes you're going to be paying the most attention to in 2021. Well, the macro theme, you know, the <clears throat> because of the economic, the, the lockdowns uh, and the contraction in GDP around the world, uh, the macro theme is just basically watching the economy and all of the major governments' response to this crisis and their response. The central banks have shown that the only thing they know how to do is uh, create currency. By the way. Uh, I'm trying to get as many people to refer to the proper definitions of currency and money as possible. Money, there's, there's some attributes that currency and money have to have. And currency has to be a medium of exchange, a unit of account. It's got to be portable, durable, divisible, something called fungible, where all the units are interchangeable. Uh, if you loan me a $20 bill, I can pay you back a 10, a 5, and five ones, and you don't care. That's fungibility. Money has to be all of those things, plus a store of value. Currency does not have to be a store of value. Money has to be a store of value. Uh, gold uh, purchases relatively the same amount as it did in uh, ancient Rome. I mean, it stores value over the centuries, it stores mm -hmm. value. It bounces up and down in a range of purchasing power. Uh, right now, its purchasing power is very, very low compared to all the stuff that we have in society. You know, a couple thousand years ago, uh, people had a, a, a bed, a goat, a pair of shoes, <laughs> one outfit of clothes, and that was like it. Today, yeah. everybody's got cell phones and TVs and cars and, and all this other stuff, but there's relatively the same amount of gold per person. And so gold should be purchasing Many, many, many times more stuff. Why doesn't it? Because we diluted gold's purchasing power with all of the other liquid financial assets that we've created in this 2000 year period. Uh, but really, there's about the same amount of gold per person on the planet. And, uh, and so it's purchasing power when those other assets, things like bonds and stocks, when they become less trusted and people run back towards safe havens, the, uh, the purchasing power increases many, many times. And I believe that that is what is going to be happening over the next uh, couple of years here. Yep. And this year, you asked about what I'm watching out for this year. I'm watching out for the massive currency creation that they're going to do, the dilution of the currency supply. And... I'm also trying, like I said, I'm trying to get people to call. There, there is no national currency that is money. Stop calling it money. It's not money. It doesn't store value. It's very design requires that it constantly loses value because when they uh, create currency and buy a bond with it, that's how the Federal Reserve or a central bank gets their currency into circulation. They whip up numbers out of thin air, just type them in, and then they buy something with those numbers. Those numbers are not money. Those numbers that have an official designation of a Canadian dollar or a Euro or yeah. the US dollar or the Aussie dollar, those numbers are, are just currency. They do not store value. And the reason they don't store value is because typically the central bank will purchase a bond of that country and the bond requires that principal plus interest be paid. So what is backing that currency is debt. And um, when you back the currency with debt, uh, the country has to tax the population in the future 
to pay the principal plus the interest on the debt, except the currency to pay the interest doesn't exist yet. There is yep. always more debt than there is currency. And so okay. to pay that uh, interest, you've got to create more currency. So they have to dilute the currency supply constantly over the, over the years. They, they, it's impossible to not dilute the currency supply in a fiat currency system like this, a debt-based fiat currency system, without collapsing the whole thing. Right. So they have to steal purchasing power from people constantly through this dilution. Anyway, yeah. that's a, a tangent I went <laughs> off way too much. But uh, I am looking for, I, I do think that this year, there's going to be some tremendous market correction. Okay. Uh, I think that people are start going to start coming to the conclusion uh, that they have to sort of run for safety uh, in this. Interesting. Um, now, a lot of people think that the uh, markets are so manipulated now by uh, the central banks and the governments that they can't crash anymore, that they're just going to go up. Well, why did they, why did they do such a, an enormous pullback in March? I believe that um, the world's central banks can manipulate the markets, but they can't uh, overwhelm the free market, overcome the free market uh, in the short term. What they can do is create a tremendous amount of currency after a market crash, get the markets to go up. And when they do that, they steal wealth from the poor and the middle class, people that are holding on to currency, and they uh, boost financial assets such as the stock market, making Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos uh, sent a billionaires. You know? So yeah. they're, they're yeah. stealing from the pop rest of the population. And they're bestowing that stolen wealth upon the wealthiest people on the planet. So, okay, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff in there I want to unpack. And I just want to begin by saying a, lo a lot of what you're talking about, you've covered in a, a series of videos called A History of Money. I think there's... The hidden secrets of money. The hidden secrets of money. That's right. That's right. And these were put out like, what, seven years ago, Mike? It was over a 10-year process. The last one was just about two, two years ago, I think. Okay. Um, okay. And we're coming out with a couple of new episodes that are actually part of a different series, The Formula for Prosperity. Okay. Hidden Secrets of Money. And I found these, yeah. I guess, five, six years ago. They're excellent. And, I, you know, there was like a six part series when I found them. Everybody should check this out and provides a lot of expansion on what you're talking about, about currency versus money. So they were originally made uh, for, we were going to do a, a series for PBS or the History Channel. So this is shot in 18 countries, two full-time animators. Uh, Dan Rubach is my producer, director, and he edits the thing and scores it. Uh, and uh, these are done to a very, very high standard. They are. Uh, when you're shooting in 18 countries, I mean, it, you know, these things are not cheap. We've spent more than a million dollars on this 10-part series. And uh, uh, it's not your average YouTube stuff. And then we give it away for free. It's, it's just good knowledge. And if you want to see the production quality, start with the last one, episode 10, and then go back and watch some of the others. But episodes 9 and 10, to me, uh, I think that it's worth somebody making a bowl of popcorn and putting it on their big screen TV. Got it. All right. All right. Okay. Now you, you mentioned a couple of things there, forecasting and market correction. You know, a lot of the people that I talk to are completely aligned with this. You know, if this occurs 2021, 20, it's hard to time these things. I don't ask for right. specifics, but you know, in that scenario, Mike, would you expect a similar response this time to the crash we had in March where there's a flight to us dollars before cash gets redistributed to probably hard assets instead of financial assets? Uh, there will be both because each time it's going to be less and less a flight to U.S. dollars because when you talk about the U.S. dollar, you're usually talking about U.S. treasuries. Sure. And bonds are becoming, I mean, if you have a population that, has, that isn't as rich as it was the previous year and our GDP contracted because of these lockdowns, uh, so if you have a, a smaller tax base, uh, the bonds become more and more suspect over the years because the bonds rely on future taxation. This is part of, you know, <clears throat> we live in a modern monetary system that is a, um, it, it's, it's a feudal type of system. There, we are serfs because <laughs> we have to work to replace stolen purchasing power uh, that they do through taxation to pay the principal and the interest 
Uh, I mean, we're paying off in the U.S. We've got a 30-year bonds. So <laughs> we're paying off uh, um, the prosperity that we enjoyed under uh, the first George Bush, you know, <laughs> back in the 90s. We just finished paying off the Ronald Reagan era. <laughs> mm. uh, so, <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, there is a market crash coming, but each time there is a flight to safety, you're going to see a, a higher percentage go toward gold, silver, and cryptos, and a smaller percentage going toward uh, bonds because bonds uh, in a shrinking GDP and you know the big brokerage firms can figure this out. It takes them a little longer. I mean, I'm surprised that it took them uh, this long to start identifying cryptocurrencies and stuff. As you know, we're starting to see um, uh, big firms that uh, are normally investing in only traditional financial assets starting to go into cryptocurrency. We're starting to see uh, big pension funds uh, announce that they're going to be purchasing gold. Uh, and uh, this is just something that is a transition. And these guys are late, <laughs> but they're still, they can still make the party. Uh, yeah. They're just not early for the party. Uh, you and I were early for this party, <laughs> which is great. I mean, gold has been, gold and silver have been the uh, number one perform, you know, behind cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and such. Yeah. Um, uh, they've been the number one performing asset of this century. Uh, and people still think it's a lunatic fringe thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right. the average yeah. person. I well, remember uh, back in uh, 2001, 2002, I was trying to get people to uh, take a look at gold and they'd say, gold, that's been going down for 20 years. That's the worst investment you could make. And I'd say, exactly. It's been going down for 20 years. Don't you get that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Can't go down forever. <laughs> now, have you been surprised, though, Mike? Because 2021 got off to a crazy start. You know, there's been some chaos. I'm, I'm in Canada, but south of the border, there's been some some. Oh, yeah. Events. Gold hasn't responded the way it typically does or historically does to chaos. And has that surprised right. you? Or, or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it surprises me, except the official price of gold is set by paper contracts, the gold futures. And, uh, and uh, during this period of time, for some reason, you know, the stock market was going up. So uh, the big brokerage houses and so on, the big, really big investors weren't shaken up that much by all of the violence over the summer and the rioting and the shutdowns and everything else. Uh, what was happening during that period of time is the Federal Reserve created massive amounts of currency, and then they have to uh, get the uh, they have to try to make the population uh, comfortable to the, get the population to believe that ev excuse me everything is all right, and uh, to do that for some reason. People think that the stock market is the economy these days. Right. It wasn't like that back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But ever since the NASDAQ bubble of, of 2000, people have identified the stock market with the economy. And so what the Federal Reserve does, you know, under their normal open market operations, when they used to stimulate the economy uh, by buying or selling financial assets, they would do that from the big brokerage houses that are the primary dealers that purchase bonds directly from the treasury. When Ben Bernanke introduced quantitative easing, they started buying uh, financial assets from um, non-bank entities. And the Federal Reserve doesn't create the dollars that you and I use. They only create dollars that circulate within the Federal Reserve system, only accounts at the Federal Reserve. So those dollars never leave the Federal Reserve. Uh, and uh, so when they buy something from a non-bank entity, they can't pay them. What they have to do is they pay their bank that has an account at the Federal Reserve, and then their bank creates a dollar for each. For You purchase a billion dollars worth of bonds from, from uh, some um, uh, fund, uh, a pension fund, a hedge fund, and then you pay their bank a, a Federal Reserve dollar. That dollar can't leave the Federal Reserve. It's in the bank's account of the Federal Reserve. The bank then creates a bank credit dollar and puts it in the account of that pension fund. 
Uh, so for every dollar of, um, of reserves that you see, there's actually $2 that got created. Mm. Um, and uh, when they do this, there is this incredible correlation between the amount of base currency that the Federal Reserve creates and the stock market. Uh, during the years that Ben Bernanke was doing QE1, 2, and 3, the correlation was 0.976. That means it was 97.6% the same. Mm. <laughs> With a little bit of time delay, the stock market went up by the same percentage over the same period of time. Right. And so, um, uh, there, I, I'm sorry, I can't even remember what the question was. I went off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. No, I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, we started talking about your thoughts on what would occur in the next market crash. Okay. Because in March, you know, there was this flight. Well, they won't be able to control the crash. All they can do is transfer wealth after the crash and make the richest people on the planet richer by stealing from the poor and the middle class. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, this system, it, you know, it works as long as we're growing, right? A, a debt-based system works as long as there's growth. I wonder, you know, thinking back and to- And we've had contraction lately. You yeah. Know, we're not back up to the levels where we were in February of 2020. And I have um, to think that that contraction is, is just getting started. If you look at so many small to medium businesses, yes. I mean, we're, we're going to float the big corpse, right? But it's right. restaurateurs, it's the hotel operators, they're operating- yep. 40 to 50% capacity. It's not profitable. Right. And they're out of their uh, backup capital at this point. That's right. You know, they've, they've been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And the ones that haven't gone out of business are hanging on by their fingernails. Oh, yeah. Trying and to... here the government comes along with a pair of nail clippers. Right. <laughs> yeah. this is, I'm sorry I'm laughing. I shouldn't be laughing. But yeah. it's, uh, it's, you can see the predictability of this stuff and how... You know, when you look at the, the uh, CDC and so on, you see the, uh, the uh, death rates, the new, what the, the new data that they've published, and they've closed down the world economy, and they are going to be killing uh, far more people through this collapse in GDP. There is a direct correlation to a country's prosperity, uh, financial prosperity, with their, uh, their lifespan. And so if you reduce everybody's lifespan in the country by making them poorer so that they have less access to quality health care, uh, high quality food, and so on, right. uh, then uh, it, it's basically uh, tantamount to committing murder. They are, uh, they're going to end up doing the equivalent of killing more people than they're saving. And this is all to make some drug companies uh, just uber wealthy. So, okay. Okay. I want to cover a couple other things while I still have time. And, you know, one thing that struck me about you and your business, Mike, is you, I think you were the first precious metals dealer to accept crypto as payment for metals. Yes. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. So what were you seeing? And, and I guess how, how did those two asset classes play together for you right now? Uh, well, I see them playing on the same team. They're both uh, safe haven financial assets uh, and they, offer you a bunch of different attributes. Uh, gold and silver are three-dimensional. They have weight. They can't vanish. Uh, they probably, you know, Bitcoin started from uh, zero. It had no value. Mm. Its first value was established in 2010 when two Papa John's pizzas were w worth about 15 bucks a piece were yeah. traded for 10,000 Bitcoins. So that established a price of one third of one penny. And then more and more people discover it. This is the first new financial asset in 400 years. There's, you know, uh, the first um, uh, representation of a bond that we know of goes back to uh, 2400 BC in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. Uh, there, the uh, um, uh, stocks were traded uh, about, they started trading about 500 years ago and a little over 400 years ago. Uh, was the first common stock issued from the British East India Company. Uh, real estate and commodities have existed forever. And so uh, this is the first financial, new financial asset class in 400 years. And it started from zero. Of course, the gains have been spectacular. They've been the biggest gains uh, in all of history. There is no bull market that even that can compare uh, to, I mean, it's, Bitcoin right now, from its initial price, is up 1.2 billion percent. 
right. billion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, is it going to have gains like that again in the future? I doubt that very much. And now uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, former uh, chairman of the uh, chairwoman of the, uh, uh, the IMF and now the head of the European Central Bank, uh, has said that uh, she's calling on governments to try and regulate Bitcoin. Well, they can't regulate Bitcoin, but what they can do is they can um, uh, cut off its, uh, it, it, the gateways to being able to convert yep. Bitcoin to fiat currencies yep. and make it very difficult for somebody uh, because it's not being used in transactions. The mm -hmm. big hope and dream when I, in 2014, I went to a, a Bitcoin conference, Bitcoin on the Beltway in Washington, DC. And, um, and I saw that this was a tool for freedom, that it was this awesome thing. And I invested in it. I told all my insiders that I was going to be putting a percentage of my portfolio in it. And I started accepting Bitcoin. I was first precious metals dealer to accept Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, and we're still the crypto friendly dealer. But what I do is I ride these things for their spectacular gains. And when they're going into a top, I convert some of the profits, uh, profits into yeah. precious metals. Because uh, if there's a problem with the internet, then there's no cryptocurrencies. If there's a problem with power, there are no cryptocurrencies. And these are genuine risks that you have to plan for. And so to be on both sides of the fence here, to have investments in both is the safest thing that I think somebody can do. Okay. Okay. I love it. Now I want to touch on some of the content you create because I mean, you mentioned the million dollar budget on these videos. You've written uh, a guide to investing in gold and silver, the best selling gold and silver investment book of all time. And I know you've got a pipeline of books that you're working on. I mean, you're always writing. Yeah. So a few questions for you, Mike, why do you do it? You know, what's the mission? What's the, what's the driving force behind creating all this content and you invest in it, right? Like you said, it's not yeah. just off the cuff. There's a lot of work put into this stuff. And how relevant is a guide to investing in gold and silver today versus when you published it? Um, it's actually more relevant today than when I published it. And what's uh, interesting is I've watched all of my predictions come true. And about uh, seven out of, you know, there's like 10 bases. There's, there's some premises of the, of the book. And I said some things that I thought were going to happen, the most likely scenarios. And uh, about seven out of the 10 have come true and the rest of them have yet to come true, but I believe that they will. Uh, and so it, it's still very relevant. I would like to update it, but it is a tremendous amount of work. And, you know, I'm dyslexic. Writing is an, is an enormous amount of work for me. It's a very laborious task and I really don't enjoy doing it. Mm. Uh, I, I have the concepts and I want to get them out there. Uh, but it is a, a tremendous amount of work. Uh, I've got another book that I've been working on that uh, I'm hoping comes out. And it's the urgent book uh, called Great Gold and Silver Rush of the 21st Century, because I do believe that this will be the greatest rush of all time. Uh, it's going to be global. It's never been global before. Uh, the, the, with the scale of what is about to happen is absolutely mind boggling when you consider uh, that, you know, gold went up about 25 times in the uh, gold rush of the 70s okay. and silver went up about 35 times in the gold rush of the 70s. Um, this time, or, and, and back then, about two thirds of the world's population couldn't legally buy gold. <laughs> you had no markets in, in China. Right. Uh, in, uh, in the USSR, uh, it was illegal to own gold. You know, right. you could be for hoarding gold in China. You could be put to death. Uh, India was just absolutely. I remember back in the seventies and eighties seeing Life magazine, this giant magazine that was meant for your coffee table, beautiful magazine uh, with pictures of like um, uh, you know after monsoons there would be all of this starvation and, and the starvation that was going on in Africa. And now you've got billionaires in all these countries. And um, when, when, the, when the billionaires start trying to protect their wealth, billionaires all over the world start trying to protect their wealth with precious metals, 
<laughs> you're going to see some fireworks. It's a complete, you know, in the United the U.S. citizens couldn't participate until the first day of 1975. And for uh, Australia, it wasn't until the first day of 1976. Mm. So you had the, the U.S. wasn't even part of the first half of that gold rush. Uh, it's, it's going to be something breathtaking. Uh, and so that's that book. And while writing that, I was trying to describe the difference of uh, price versus value because people are just, when, when you measure things in US dollars or just one fiat currency, it, fiat currencies all lie to you. You cannot see what the true value of something is unless you uh, measure if you sell that thing, how much other, how much groceries, how much gasoline, how much, what percentage of a house can you buy with it? How much of the, how many shares of the Dow Jones Industrial Average could you buy with it? Or the S&P 500. When you measure barrels of oil, tons of iron, bushels of wheat, uh, when you measure it against other stuff, you, you'll discover that throughout the centuries, everything is trapped in this valuation channel, bouncing up and down. You measure your house in ounces of gold, uh, you'll, you'll see this. And the trick is to sell something when it's up here and identify the things that are down here and buy them. <laughs> and now you've escaped that thing I call a valuation channel and you're gaining true wealth. And we've done, I mean, I did a tremendous amount of um, uh, my researchers uh, uh, have done tremendous amounts of study on this, gathering data on prices of things going back, you know, 400 years or more in some cases uh, to, uh, uh, to prove this. And so that's called Wealth Cycles. And uh, that's a book that sort of, when, when, gold <laughs> when the great gold and silver rush of the 21st century frayed, it split into two books and it just became too much work and I put it off because there's a really important book Great Gold and Silver Rush is, is, is an urgent book. Uh, Wealth Cycles is a very informative book, but the important book is Formula for Prosperity that I've actually been working on since 2011. Wow. Uh, and uh, there's, um, uh, yeah, and there's the formula I actually put out there in uh, 2013 uh, it was a early version of the formula, so there's some mistakes in it, but it's a literal formula that where you can sort of uh, calculate. There's, there's some of the, the equations in it where that are somewhat subjective. You have to pick a value, but when you have a lot of data, that becomes fairly easy to do. To, right. When you're comparing it to other countries or other societies or uh, other people. So this can be, this is a formula that can, that can be applied to the world to a country, to a state, a city, or an individual. Okay. Okay. Mike, look, it's been awesome having you. Um, one last thing. Yeah, what's it's up? About, it's about where prosperity comes from and what extinguishes it. The goal for um, uh, Hidden Secrets of Money has a mission of enlightening the world that maximum prosperity can only be achieved through individual freedom, free markets, and sound money. Uh, the goal for Formula prosper for Prosperity is just to bring maximum prosperity for all of mankind. I love so it. That's the reason I do it. Yeah. Okay. Mike, look, it's been great catching up. I'm glad we did this. It's been uh, it's been a few years, so it's nice that we connected. Get get, get you back for our audience and uh, your uh, viewers can download uh, the uh, guide to investing in gold and silver at my website, goldsilver.com. It's free. Appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jay.